Section one. You are going to listen to a telephone conversation between a caller and a call center operator. As you listen, complete the numbered spaces in the identification form in the book. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Platinum Card Service, Rebecca speaking. How may I help you? I've got a few problems with my credit card account. Okay. What is your credit card number?、Mm, let's see. It's here somewhere. Ah, here it is. The identification and security check is for a platinum card service, so card has been written down in the space. Now the test will begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Platinum Card Service, Rebecca speaking. How may I help you? I've got a few problems with my credit card account. Okay, what is your credit card number?、Mm, let's see, it's here somewhere. Ah, here it is. Can I just take the card number, please? Yes, it's six double nine two. Six double nine two. Three double four three. Three double four three. Double one four seven. Double one four seven. Eight nine two one. Eight nine two one, right. Can I just check that? Um, six double nine two, three double four three, double one four seven, eight nine two one. That's it. And your name? Carlos de Silva. I just need to check a few details for identification and security, if you'll bear with me. That's okay. And what's your postcode? S E one eight P B. S E one eight P B. That's it. Vauxhall Close, London. Yes, that's right. And the house number. Um, forty three. And can you give me your date of birth? Thirteenth of the seventh, sixty three. And one further check, if I may, can you give me your mother's maiden name? Yes, it's Moore. Is that M double O R E? Yes, that's it. Before the caller and operator continue their telephone conversation, look at questions six to ten. Now listen to the next part of the conversation and answer questions six to ten. For these questions, there are three alternatives: A, B, and C. Decide which alternative is the most suitable answer and circle the correct letter. Yes. Now, can we get on with this? Yes, sir. Certainly. I'm sure you'll appreciate that all these checks are necessary for security reasons. So, what exactly is the problem? Problems. Okay. Well, first, um, your computer seems to have gone mad. I sent you five hundred pounds, and on the statement for the account, it shows that I only paid three hundred. Yes, the account does only show three hundred pounds was paid. Well. I paid the five hundred pounds in at the bank, and I have my receipt. And my bank statement shows that five hundred pounds has been taken from my account. 
Oh, I see. What I'll do is check with the bank and see what they say. Okay. You said there was something else. Yes, as if that wasn't enough. My account shows that £107.27 was paid to a company called Pan Express. I don't know who this is. Let's have a look. Well, it is genuine. I can assure you it's not mine. It was made on the evening of the 12th of May. Maybe it's a restaurant bill you forgot about? There's no way that... Oh, oh wait, hold on. Yes. Oh, it's OK. I've just realised what it is. It is a restaurant bill. Um, the name of the company is different from the name of the restaurant. My mistake. I'm sorry. That's OK. Was there anything else? I don't know if I dare. What is it, anyway? Um, well, it's, um... The amount of interest seems to have gone up. Hmm. If you look at your statement for April, you'll see that the rate went down from 16.27% to 14.99% that month. Oh, yes, you're right. Was that everything? Yes, basically it is. OK. And can you check my payment? Oh, yes, I'll do it. Can I phone you back? I'll be at home for the next two hours. I have to leave at 11. Right. What's your number? 020-7989-7182. Hold on. 020-7979? No, it's 7989 and then 7182. So, it's 020 7989 7182. Yes, that's it. OK, I'll phone you straight back. Thanks. Bye. That's the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You will hear part of a radio programme about do-it-yourself house painting. First you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 14. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our weekly series on home improvements. Today's program is about do-it-yourself house painting. There's never been a better time for people who like to do their own interior house painting. Although people still lead very busy lives, Thanks to the availability of various new DIY materials, you can now decorate your home in a more efficient and a more environmentally friendly way. In 2009 alone, approximately 53 million litres of the paint that was sold in the UK were left untouched. That's enough to fill 21 Olympic-sized swimming pools. It's easy to overestimate how much paint you'll need to decorate your room if you use guesswork. And if you know exactly how much paint is needed, you avoid unnecessary waste. There are automatic paint calculators available now. Most of the major paint manufacturers provide them. Look on their websites or just Google paint calculator and see what comes up. 
Then simply measure the circumference and height of the room in metres. Enter this into the calculator, along with the type of surface you're painting, and it will tell you how many litres of paint you'll need. But if you do end up with leftover paint, you can donate it to an organisation like Community Repaint. They will take the paint from you and redistribute it to local charities and voluntary organisations, so it goes to a good home. You can find more information about Community Repaint on communityrepaint, all one word, dot org dot uk. Now you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. Another way of avoiding paint wastage is to check you're completely happy with your colour choice before starting to paint. For example, you can get a small sample of the colour you're thinking of using, then paint a board and move it around the room so you can see how it looks against your furnishings and in different lights. Also. It's always better to buy high-quality paints because you get what you pay for. If you buy cheap paint, you might need to apply two or three coats to achieve the same coverage that you'd get from one coat of a good quality paint. You could also spend a week on a job that could have been done in a day or two. And consider the environment. Most paint manufacturers now sell water-based paints that don't contain harmful chemicals or give off harmful odours, so get one of these. You can also buy paint that's packaged in recyclable containers. There's a lot more choice than there used to be. You can only do a good job which will last if you prepare the surfaces thoroughly before painting. In fact, in many ways, if you want to do a professional-looking job, this is more important than the painting itself. If there are any cracks or patches of loose plaster, painting over them won't solve the problem. Take the plaster out and fill the holes, allowing enough time for the new plaster to dry. And you won't get a smooth finish if the walls are dusty or greasy so washing with water isn't enough. Use a solution of decorator's soap and rinse well with warm water afterwards. When you're ready to paint, we suggest you use a medium pile roller for walls and ceilings. A lot of people tend to use short pile rollers, but these give a patchy finish, and that wastes paint and time. Similarly, Long pile rollers can create a thick textured effect, which looks messy. The same goes for brushes. The stronger the bristles, the easier they are to wash and reuse. And as you've chosen a water-based paint, clean your brushes with cold water, because it's more energy efficient that way. As you're decorating, keep transferring small amounts of paint into a tray and keep topping it up when you need to. This reduces the chance of it being contaminated by dust and pieces of dirt. And finally, water-based paint doesn't have a lingering smell, so that's not an issue anymore. But it's airflow rather than heat that helps the paint dry quicker. So, to help finish the job in the quickest time, Leave your doors and windows open. The faster the paint is dry and the job finished, the quicker you can start enjoying your room. In tomorrow's programme, I'll be giving some advice on...
That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to between a prospective student and a university advisor about applying to enter the university. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23 on page 125. As you listen to the first part of the conversation, answer questions 21 to 23. I'm interested in entering your business administration program, and I'd like some information on how to apply. I'm a little concerned because I've been out of school for a number of years. That could actually work to your advantage. It's possible to get academic credit for work experience if that experience is related to courses in our program. I've been working in business for several years. How would I get academic credit for that? First, you'll need to read the university catalogue to see if any of the course descriptions match your specific job experience. For example, if you've worked in accounting, you may be able to get credit for an accounting course. So, then what would I do? You would write a summary of your work experience, relating it to specific courses we offer. Submit that to the admissions office with a letter from your work supervisor confirming your experience. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 24 to 30 on page 125. Now listen and answer questions 24 to 30. Would I submit those things at the same time that I apply for admission? Well, that would be the best idea. Have you seen a copy of our university catalogue? Not the most recent one. I have a copy from last year. You'll need to look at the latest one. Unfortunately, I've run out of copies, but you can get one from the library for now, and I'll send you your own copy as soon as I have more available. Thank you. How does the admissions process work? Well, first you'll need to get an application for admission. Those are available in the admissions office. The application form contains all the instructions you'll need. That sounds simple enough. Of course. You'll need to make sure you meet all the admissions requirements. How can I know what those are? We have copies of the requirements lists for all university programs here in the Counseling Center. I'll give you one before you leave today. Will I need to get recommendations from my employer or former teachers? Oh, yes, you will. The recommendation forms are available in the admissions office. Now, I don't know if you'll also be applying for a part-time job through the university work-study program. I'm considering that. How can I find out what kinds of jobs are offered? You can access the job listings from the computers in the library. Are you planning to study full-time or part-time? I want to be a full-time student. Good. Then you'll qualify for the work-study program. Part-time students aren't eligible. As a full-time student, would I be eligible for a free bus pass? No, unfortunately, we don't have those available for any of our students. However, you can apply for financial assistance to help pay for your books or for your tuition. I'd like to look into that. Do I apply for that at the admissions office? No, that's through us. 
You'll need to make an appointment with a counsellor. That is the end of section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 4. You are going to hear a lecture on fishing. First, look at questions 31 to 36. As you can see, there are four alternative answers, A, B, C and D, for each question. Decide which alternative is the most suitable answer and circle the correct letter. Good morning again, ladies and gentlemen. And in case you've forgotten, my name is Dr North from the Marine Habitat Research Unit at the University and I'm going to continue from the lecture that I gave a fortnight ago on humankind's relationship with the sea from a historical point of view and also on attitudes to different types of fishing. In today's talk, I would like to focus on the current problems in the fishing industry in Europe and, in particular, the present scarcity of marine fish. As with the last lecture, I've placed a book list a few relevant articles and a copy of this lecture on the department website. A statistic to begin with. Since the 1970s, stocks of the most heavily fished species have fallen, on average, by 90%. And why has this happened? Well, there's a chain of events which begins with the demographic changes that have taken place in the world over the last century. During this time, the world population has grown at a phenomenal rate, with efficient and heavy fishing, which is technology-driven, meeting the increasing demands for food. As a consequence, many fishing stocks in the European waters, from the Atlantic to the North Sea and the Mediterranean, are now on the verge of collapse. But the problem is not restricted to European waters. It's a situation that's all too clear all around the world. Fish stocks in the Pacific Ocean, for example, are now on the verge of collapse due to a combination of overfishing and natural changes in ocean ecology. And there's another reason behind the increased demand for fish, and that is the changes in the eating patterns of different countries. Certain countries have a long tradition of fishing, for example, the southern European countries, but eating patterns have changed in countries like the United Kingdom, where fish was once considered as food for the poor rather than the rich. People have been turning to fish as a cheap and healthy alternative to meat, driving up demand and depleting stocks. Food scares like BSE and foot and mouth disease have also driven people away from eating meat, which again is invariably replaced by fish. Before the speaker continues, look at questions 37 to 40. As you listen, complete the table. Write no more than three words for each answer. Another important reason 
is that a sizable proportion of the catch from modern trawlers or fishing boats is thrown away. Nets quite often land fish that are not wanted and which are thrown back into the sea dead. Discarded nets and other traps are responsible for the deaths of many fish. Our seas, like the rest of our environment, are littered with rubbish which also destroys lots of fish. And fish are also being changed by the chemicals dumped into the oceans, as well as by overfishing, so the size of certain species is decreasing. More then have to be fished to produce a decent catch. And the solution? Well, there has to be more than one answer to the problem. Fish farms provide a partial solution, but the quality of the fish is usually inferior to those in the wild. Reducing the amount of fish that any one trawler or fishing boat is allowed to land is the most effective, but also the most unpopular measure. Countries in Europe like Spain rely heavily on fishing and are naturally against any step which restricts their catch. But if the depletion of fishing stocks continues, there will be no fish left to fish. Take the disappearance of cod from the great banks off Newfoundland, which was once the richest cod fishing area in the Atlantic. After a dramatic fall in the cod population for some unknown reason, a ban was imposed, which, it was hoped, would lead to a repopulation of the cod stocks. The cod did not return, and many fishermen were put out of work. This is a scenario which we do not want to be repeated on a large scale. Now, if you look at this table on the screen, you can see where I... That's the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.